No, my name is Jim Welch. I am the big kahuna around here. I'm the pastor here, and uh, welcome to Easter Sunday morning, where you never know what's going to happen. Well, the year was 60 AD. It's been about 30 years since the event that we celebrate this morning. The place is the palace of Herod Agrippa II on the coast of Caesarea, some 30, 40 miles north of Jerusalem, but on the coast. The setting is that Paul has been imprisoned in Caesarea for about two years at this point, and now he is standing in chains before the mighty king Agrippa, the great-grandson of Herod the Great, that nasty king who murdered all those babies in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Paul's case has been referred to Agrippa by a guy named Festus, who confesses, I can't really even understand the charges against Paul. I don't get it. As a Roman, Festus cannot comprehend why the Jews hate Paul. And they can't, he can't understand, why does Paul keep talking about this man who's been risen from the dead? It says, a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. You see, there in that one sentence is the whole problem with Easter. Paul believed it. The Jews didn't believe it. And the Romans couldn't understand it. The Jews said Jesus was dead, Paul said he was alive, and poor Festus, he doesn't have a clue. What is going on? So he passes the case along to Agrippa for review. And Paul's defense, his explanation to Agrippa, is actually very simple. He says to Agrippa that as a Jew and as a Pharisee, He shares in the hope that God will fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel. And if God is going to fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel, they are so grand and so huge, a resurrection is is imperative. You can't fulfill the promise without a resurrection. They go beyond the grave, these promises do. They cross generations. And then he asks a question that will resonate across the centuries. He says this, Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? What a question for Easter morning. Is it truly incredible? The word incredible means against belief. Is it incredible that God should raise the dead? I mean, which is more reasonable? That God can raise the dead or that God doesn't raise the dead? It may interest you to know that in the early stages of the church, the doctrine was hard for people to believe from the very beginning. Acts 4.2 tells us that in the earliest days of Christianity, the Jewish leaders, it says, were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Today, unbelief has has a thousand excuses. Some people refuse to believe that God raises the dead Because they've never seen it, and if they've never seen it, then it cannot be true. Others would say, oh, I can't do it, and I don't know anyone who can do it. Therefore, I don't think it really happens. Now, I have to agree that experience kind of lands on the side of unbelief. I mean, have you been to Green Hills lately? It's quiet and peaceful and serene and beautiful. Nothing much happens over there except the occasional funeral. And you see, that's our problem with the resurrection. We all have experienced funerals, but no one has experienced a resurrection. And I believe our problem with resurrection is not fundamentally intellectual. It's not scientific. It's not mechanical. It's not biological. As if we had to understand somehow how the dead are raised. In the end, it's a problem of the heart. And many people, they just don't want to believe what God said. Others are just going to worship their own intellect. If they can't explain something, it must not be true. But is it incredible? Is it against belief that God raises the dead? Let me answer that question with another question. If God can create, why can't he recreate? We know we came from dust, and we're going to dust. 
And so this thing called life is just a respite between dust and dust. It's temporary. And if God once can give life out of dust, can he do it again? Can a watchmaker, can a clockmaker fix his own creation? We can make that argument on Easter Sunday, and it may be helpful, but it also might not be totally satisfying. Because when we face the death of those we love, we need more than arguments from philosophy and logic. Which brings us back to the New Testament, to the question of what really happened on that first Easter Sunday morning. Now, we've been walking our way through Matthew's gospel for a while. Some have said, too long, huh? In the last month or so, we've been looking at the events which surround the death of Christ. And coincidentally, we, we arrive at the resurrection passage this morning. If you believe that was a coincidence, whatever. <laughs> the gospel accounts, they vary in, in, the, in the story that they tell. But in the main details, they're, they're really quite accurate and quite, quite together and absolutely clear. Now, we could spend the morning harmonizing the accounts, but I think I want to look at this just from Matthew's point of view because he has something unique to contribute to the resurrection account. Now, critics have always said, you know, you got four versions of this thing. They, they're not all exactly the same. So what's the deal with that? Well, have you ever been on a jury and listened to eyewitness testimony? It can vary. But here we have four independent stories, four independent witnesses to the truth. Not one, but four, which is actually pretty amazing. And the details of each story, they're not discrepancies. They're each just a partial telling of the story. And so they provide four independent accounts. These are not imaginary tales. If they were imaginary tales that were worked out by collusion, you know, behind the scenes, they would have, they would have been the same. Their essential agreement proves that the records of each of them is factual. So, what is Matthew's story? Well, in Matthew, it's early on Sunday morning, Matthew 28, verse 1, and it's still dark. And the sun is about to come up, and a group of women come, led by Mary Magdalene, and they set out for the tomb. On Friday, we know where they were. We just looked at that text last week and on Friday night. They had not been able to finish all that they wanted to do to the body, and they were sitting opposite the grave. But now the Sabbath has passed, uh, Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Okay? It has been 11 hours since the Sabbath ended on sunset on Saturday night. The women know where the tomb is located. They watched Joseph of Arimathea and whoever was with him take the body and put it in the inner chamber. And they watched him roll the stone across the tomb. Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. Why the earthquake? Matthew's the only one of the four Gospels to mention an earthquake. The earthquake, I think, it made sure everybody was awake. <laughs> you know, later the story is told that the, the, the soldiers say, well, we were sleeping. Oh, really? There was this earthquake. Nobody sleeps through an earthquake. The angel rolls the stone aside, and he sits on it. Verse 4, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and become like dead men. They must have fainted. The earthquake had to have been scary enough. I mean, they had just had a big one at the cross on Friday afternoon. Now here's this aftershock. So, you know, that got their attention. But when they saw the angel, apparently they fainted. And so they didn't get to hear the message the women got to hear, which is probably on purpose. The angel said to the women, verse 5, Don't be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And so here comes the first announcement of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice who gets to hear it. It is the women. Verse 6, He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. The tomb is opened, not to let Jesus out. He didn't come out. I I, kind of think the ladies were there when the earthquake happened, and they could see it sealed, and then it opens, and then so he didn't sneak out. And they could see for themselves that the angel was telling them was true, so they go inside, they take a peek. Jesus was no longer where they had watched him been laid. He is risen just as he said he was going to rise. I mean, do they come expecting to find an empty tomb? I don't think so. Other gospels tell us they brought more spices. They wanted to finish the job. They weren't expecting a a a resurrection. But they were not rebuked for their unbelief. They were given the most amazing news possible. And the word began to spread. He is risen. He is risen. It becomes the watchword of the early church. The apostles end up as martyrs because they believed with all their heart that he is risen. And after 2,000 years, I think we can safely say that when the evidence is fairly examined with an unprejudiced mind, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus died, died on Friday, and rose bodily on Sunday morning from the dead. But Matthew, the way he tells his story, he wants us to think about two issues. He confronts us with two things, and this is where I think he gets very interesting. He tells the story in a way that forces us to do two things. Number one, you are forced to listen to the testimony of the least of these. Who receives the news first? It's the women. Who shares the message first? It's the women. All of the Gospels agree on this. In so many of the Gospels, women are where in the stories? They're kind of behind the scenes. They're always there, but they're never really up in the front. They're always faithful and always present, but usually in the background. But now in the story of the resurrection, they are front and center. And here's the problem for the first century reader. The testimony of a woman is not admissible in Jewish court. It was codified in the law. They're unreliable. The word of a woman had no public credibility in that culture. But God chose to reveal the miracle of the resurrection to the women. First, they were then told to take the news about the empty tomb to the disciples. Now, on that morning, you need to understand there was great risk for them. They are at a tomb guarded by soldiers of of a man who had just been killed for a capital crime, a political capital crime, and they'd crucified him. The guards could have reported who they were to the authorities. I mean, this is a movement they want to crush. They don't want this spreading at all. And so the risk of the women, it's made even more dramatic because of what? Where are the men? Where are the disciples? Well, they aren't there. Apparently, they're laying low, paralyzed by fear, maybe grief. And yet we are asked to believe what? That these women, as the first witnesses of the resurrection, that's who tell us the story. It's the testimony of the least of these. Now, to me, that says this is no made-up story. Because if you're creating a narrative... The disciples are going to be there first. They're going to be the heroes. This had to be how it happened. This is real. And Matthew is forcing us to listen to the testimony of the women. That's what he's doing. Second thing, Matthew says in his story form, is that you are forced to the place where you have to make a decision. He's been very careful crafting his story, his narrative up until this point of decision. For you see, Matthew writes this as a personal journey. Matthew is the guy who sold out everything for money. He sold out his nation. He sold sold out his people. There were two teams you could join in the first century in, in Palestine, in Israel. You could join Team Rome, who ruled the place with an iron fist, or you could join Team Israel. 
Matthew's a Jew. He ought to be on what? Team Israel. But he doesn't. He joins Team Rome because it's much more lucrative. It's hard to be a Jew and collect taxes. You've got to join Team Rome. And so he does it to make a living, to make himself wealthy and to take care of his family. And so he's on Team Rome. And now he is challenging his first century Jewish listener to go on the same journey that he went on, to ask who's right. Because Matthew, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, has switched teams. And so he asks us to decide who's right, who are you going to believe, who are you going to trust. And he sets that journey up in story form at the, at the, in the last part of chapter 27. In verse 61 of chapter 27, he says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they're sitting at the tomb, they're watching. It's Friday night. And then on Saturday morning, verse 62 of Matthew 27, it says this. Matthew writes, the next day, Saturday, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Uh Uh-oh, we got a problem. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Ah, Pilate, you know, take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. You have that alternative narrative being being made. Then you've got the text we just read in Matthew 28, starting in verse 1 with the resurrection account. Then Matthew returns to this alternative narrative in chapter 28, verse 11. He writes, when the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. They bought them off telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were asleep. Now, you weren't asleep because there was an earthquake. But anyway, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Matthew was alternating between this false narrative to what the women say, then back to the false narrative. And he's going back and forth. Why? So that you can look at the facts and you can make a decision. And he lays out these two things, version A, version B, side by side. You're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to evaluate it. His whole point is, which story are you going to believe? Will you believe the testimony of the women? Or will you believe the lies and the deceit of the political and religious authorities and just ignore the eyewitness testimony? Because if you're going to believe the women, they're setting a pattern here. And if you listen to them, you are setting yourself up for what? For rejection and dishonor at the hands of these hostile authorities. It's not going to be just in the first century. It's going to be moving down. So what are you going to do? Who are you going to believe? And that brings me back to the most basic question once again. Is it incredible that God will raise the dead? Well, it isn't incredible if we believe in God because our real problem is not with the empty tomb 2,000 years ago. Almost everyone believes that. The most recent Gallup poll I could find, 77% of American adults in 2016 said, yeah, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You see, our deepest struggle comes when we stand by a casket and we look at the face of somebody that we love and we wonder... Is it really possible that I will see them again? Death seems so final. All the statistics argue against it. You don't hear about people being raised from the dead. Death, it just seems to win every single time. So how do we deal with this problem? I think you deal with this problem with a series of statements. Follow along. Grant, number one, that God is God. He's God. Number two, grant that God is omnipotent. He says he's got all power. Grant that he knows everything. Grant that he has promised to raise the dead. 
grant that he raised his son from the dead. And then consider the final statement. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, he can do anything. As Spurgeon put it, difficulty is not in the dictionary of the Godhead. If God can raise Jesus, then he can raise our, he can raise our loved ones who now rest in the grave. And it's no harder for, for God to raise 10 million people than it is for him to raise just one. The number, the location, the cause of death, the location of the remains, none of it matters to God. God will have no trouble reassembling those atoms to make up the molecules that constitute the bodies of those who are believing in Jesus Christ. He's God and he can do it. Which brings us to the issues for today. Perspective is what we need at this point. See, God doesn't ask us to start in 2022 and then figure out resurrection going backwards. It never works that way. You can't start with, well, how does he do it today? And what's he doing? And figure out how he can do it. That question's unanswerable. Instead, God says what? Start with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Start with the empty tomb that Jesus rose from the dead and reason forward. If he did it for Jesus, then he can do it for us. How did he do it? I don't know. But what he did for the Savior, he will do for those who follow the Savior. And having said that, I understand people, they're going to have problems with this. They're going to totally reject what I'm saying. But for a moment, let's consider four stones. They like to roll instead of the one stone that the angel rolled away. We like to add a stone of our own because we don't want to face that empty tomb. Stone number one is atheism. They just believe, you know, the dead cease to exist. We live, we die, that's it. End of story. We come from nowhere, we're going nowhere. Life is all there is. But we have the clear testimony of the Word of God that, that this life isn't all there is. It's just the beginning. We're going to live somewhere forever. Stone number two, we roll in front of humanism in front of our tombs. There's no power. I haven't seen any power to raise the dead. Well, that's true. There is no power on earth that can raise the dead. People who say this believe that science and the human intellect are the final arbiters of truth. They know. We know. And if we can't reproduce it ourselves, it must not exist. There's God, though. Third stone is rationalism. Well, God doesn't interfere in the laws of human nature. It supposes that if there is a God, you know, he's, he's not really all that involved in his creation. And, and once he set it in motion, he's, he's on vacation. He's away, done, whatever. It flies in the face of everything that the Bible says about the character of our God, who not only established the universe, but upholds it by the word of his power. The only reason there are laws of nature is because God established laws of nature. He is the supreme lawgiver. He can suspend the law of death and bring in one of resurrection. If he's God, that has to be true. Third stone we often hear rolled in front of the tomb is liberalism. That, that, that declares that, that God nowhere promises a resurrection. Where is that in the Bible? It's a myth. It's created by the early church. Don't listen to it. But it contradicts most of the historical record and common sense. Not to, mean, not to speak of, of, the, of the clear teaching of the Bible. Did you know that there are, you, nobody doubts the existence of the Iliad with its 1,800 manuscripts, but we have 25,000 biblical manuscripts. It is the most well-attested document of antiquities. Jesus, if he is still dead, he has damned the world to hell. You see, Matthew is leading us to make a decision. Is Jesus Christ really the Son of God? It's been his argument from chapter 1, verse 1. And now it's time to come to a decision. The story's just about over. The disciples, they have decided. They did it up there at Banyas. That Canaanite woman made her decision up in the north. The centurion in charge of the crucifixion made his decision. This is the Son of God. The woman 
who sat across at the tomb, who showed up this morning. They're going to get to see Jesus in a second. We're not going to look at it. But they, they, they worship him. They made their decision. Now, if you make a decision today, life might be full of tears today, heartache. It might be tomorrow, too. And it probably will be next week, too. But if you know Jesus, then in the end, when all is said and done, and we come to the last road or the bend of the road in our life, the promise is this, all things end well. One of my favorite stories involves the funeral of Sir Winston Churchill. Most of us know him as the man who single-handedly rallied the British Empire during World War II to defeat Nazi Germany. By the power of his words, he gave an entire country hope. Before he died, he planned his own funeral service, which was at St. Paul's in London. The service was magnificent, filled with, with biblical liturgy and great hymns. And then just as the benediction was, was pronounced, an unseen bugler, hidden in one side of the dome above, began to play this. The traditional melody signaling the end of the day, the death of a soldier. But as those notes fade away, another bugler on the other side of the dome began to play this. Reveille, the traditional song announcing the coming of a new day. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. It's time to get up this in the morning. It was Winston Churchill's way of saying that though he was dead, he expected to get up on the day of resurrection. For the believer, the cemetery is like the tomb of Jesus, a temporary resting place on our voyage to eternity with God. And God will sound reveille, and we will rise from the dead. So I end where I began. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? God is God. He can raise the dead. He did it for Jesus. He can do it for you. Are you ready to believe the testimony of Matthew? You've heard from the witnesses, so what's your decision? The question Paul asked in Caesarea resonates today. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? If Jesus is who he says he is, then he can do it. Are you going to roll another one of those stones across the tomb and ignore it for another year? The king lives. Will you follow him? If we've learned anything through this trek, through the closing pages of Matthew, it is this. The silence of God does not mean the absence of God. God was silent as he hung on the cross. After the cross, some things happened, but he died alone. And so much time in our lives, we think the silence of God in my life must mean God is absent. But God is at work in the silent moments of your life just as he was in those final silent moments as Jesus hung on the cross. God was working out his plan. He wasn't silent. God has worked out his plan. He brought you here this morning. Are you listening? Matthew made the decision to follow Jesus. Have you made yours? Do you have doubts? You might. It's okay. God never turns an honest doubter away. Never. You bring your doubts. You bring your skepticism. You bring your unbelief and your hard questions and your uncertainties. God loves hard questions. We love hard questions. Doubt's not a sin. It's what you do with that doubt that makes all the difference. So you come to him just as you are. Bring your doubts and your questions with you. He will not turn you away. So what am I asking you this morning? 
I'm asking you to consider, is it time to believe that Jesus can and will give, keep his promise to give you eternal life because of what he did and when he died and how he died for you on the cross? I'm asking you to believe that what Jesus did on the cross and in the resurrection guarantees for you eternal life if you'll just believe. Follow the path of Matthew whose life was changed dramatically because at his tax-collecting booth outside of Capernaum, he met Jesus. And he had all of his sins forgiven because Jesus can forgive it all. He found forgiveness for all his rebellion against his people, for joining Team Rome. So what's your decision? Do you need forgiveness? I would assume you probably do. I'm going to pray as we close. I'm going to pray something that I prayed decades ago when I stepped across the line and decided to ask Jesus to set me free. You can follow me in it. It doesn't matter what you say. The words are not magic or some formula, but just trying to express something from your heart. So let me first pray for you, for everyone, and then you can follow along. Let's pray. Father, it's Easter Sunday, and there are likely here people who have never really begun a real relationship with you. They know about you, but they've never really gotten to know you. I pray that you would help them to have the courage to make the wisest decision of their lives. And for those of us who've known you for years, maybe decades, may you overwhelm us anew and afresh with the wonder of resurrection truth. So now you pray, if you'd like to, something like this, not out loud, just in your heart. Lord Jesus, I freely confess that I'm a sinful person. I know I cannot hide the truth from you. All the good things I've done, just like filthy rags in your sight. But I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for bearing the penalty I deserved for my sin. And so this morning I believe that you died and rose on the third day to provide your righteousness in the place of my sin. And so I trust you completely for my salvation. Please be my Savior right now. In Jesus' name, amen.